OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Welcome along. It is the Hurling Pod on the back of the penultimate weekend of the regular section of the league. And realistically, after what's happened this weekend, we know what Division 1A and 1B is going to look like for next year. But we've still got plenty to play for going into the last week. If Galway, who now have home advantage against Limerick, were to win, and Tipperary is expected, get a big win against Antrim, Limerick, who are unbeaten, 100% start, could potentially go out in scoring difference and miss out in the semi-final next Saturday afternoon. In Division 1A, we know that Wexford are going to be in that division next year after they beat Waterford. Lots of your questions are about Davy Fitzgerald. I'm sure Scale will have no opinion whatsoever <laughs> about how Davy and Waterford have been going so far this season. Uh, we can also talk about the top of the table clash where, uh, again, this always seems like a bit of a misnomer Kilkenny now half and won in Ennis in 11 years and now you think how often do they actually play each other there but uh, the good run for Clare in the league has continued against Kilkenny Kilkenny man Paul Murphy will no doubt point to the fact that Kilkenny have won the last two times they met in the championship in All-Ireland semi-finals so all that to chat about including Westmead's first win of the campaign where they got a victory against Antrim in Division 1B at the weekend as well and it's very clear how things look at the top of 2A so Carlo are going to be going through to the final Leash have got a home semi-final and then it's kind of a mix of any of the rest could qualify in the other spot for the second semi-final. So it is an interesting hurling pod ahead. We'll talk about all those games, but there's only one place to start. And that is this man, Johnny Glynn, back in Galway hurling training. Glynn, an All-Ireland winner with his county in 2017, last played for the Maroon in 2019 in the Leinster Senior Hurling Round Robin. James Gall, you were on the same team as him then. You've been manifesting that this was going to happen, that Johnny Glynn was going to the make word. a great return. Damn you, I was waiting for that word to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I manifested this situation, you took it off me. <laughs> I was like, yes. What word can I use that won't get caught with me? Manifestation. If you just say it enough, lads, it'll happen. Johnny <laughs> Glynn's going to win an All-Star. Johnny Glynn's going to win an All-Star. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that this year. <laughs> you could have said Johnny Glynn's going to win an All-Star the middle, but you picked All-Star, so you're after, you're after scoping yourself there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> true cares. You can get your quarter final in an All Star. <laughs> no, not, not today's game. Jesus, no. <laughs> he's back, lads. He's back. How, how are we feeling? We're, we must be excited, surely. Well, Henry said he's he's not back. Henry said he's actually not on the panel. Like, so well, I've learned anyway. Don't believe them, Kikin, lads. <laughs> don't believe them, lads. <laughs> Whatever the lads say, don't believe Except them. Except they're a Galway manager, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> the big man is back, lads. Just long to Johnny. Don't mind the sharp ball tactic. Just long to Johnny. And every, everyone else just feed off him. Right, give us a scoop. Give us a scoop on this girl, because I gave you the scoop initially when a member of a management team, who I will continue to keep my source anonymous on this, had told me a few weeks back that he was heading home from New York. He was going to go back in, train with the Galway panel, and we would see what happened after that. Now, based on what Henry said after the game today, it would seem that he's going to go back for New York, New York for a while and come back to Galway. How realistic is it that we actually see Johnny Glynn touch a ball this summer for Galway? I think it has to be realistic because he, if you go back a few months ago, like he featured for a draft in their club championship, you know, and, and like and featured prominently in fairness on their run uh, into the uh, the quarter final. But like, I think he, there, there needs to be how to put this now, like kind of nearly a mutual decision between the two of them either you're in or you're not. So kind of, there can be no real, you know, bit part come day go day because inter county is far different to club as we know. Um, but I truthfully, before we go any further, I genuinely didn't know he was coming back. I had no, there was no rumors around the county he was coming back. The rumours weren't exactly rumours. They were more, you know, wishes, if, if you like. Um, so I'm delighted to see him back. But where does he play then is another question. Because um, the way the game, like his last game, as you noted, was 2019. And in that four or five seasons, the game has evolved and changed dramatically from what, from what it was then. So it's a much shorter game now, um, a much faster game, I have to say, with a close context. So maybe we have to put him on the edge of the square and just get everyone lumped the ball into him. And that's as much damage as as, as, as he might cause. It could be perfect. Um but very interesting to see how he goes because he's been playing football predominantly, as you know, at a county level um, and featuring well there. So there's no question over his fitness, physique, you know, injuries, all that. That's, that'll be all fine. We, I know Johnny well. He does the bite, that's for sure. So, so he won't be caught lacking there. It's just the hurling speed. Uh, how fast can he get it back up to, to, to said speed and see can he be a, a big influence for Galway while we win that Ireland tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> all right. During that process. Too late. Too late. <laughs> Realistically, Murph, how difficult is it? Nearly five years now at this stage, going back to the summer of 2019, last game was against Dublin in the round robin, to have been away from inter-county hurling for that long. As Scal says, he's been playing football the last few years for New York. He's a guy who's in really good shape. He bumped into him in Crow Park last year. He looked like he was uh, ready to walk onto an inter-county pitch. But how much will have been lost 
in the five years away from playing Intercounty Hurling. Yeah, there, there'll definitely be a sharpness lost. Like if he came back from uh, the start of this year, let's say, and was involved with Galway, I'd say something. That's that's again is something where you're, he's exposed himself to um, at the earliest opportunity to league hurling, get a nice bit of league hurling in, and then go into a round robin. But like from Henry's comments after the game, I think he was speaking to Darren Frehill after the game. He said that he's back for a week. He's going to go back to New York and they're hoping to get him back for a week again and, and take it from there. Like the closer it gets to the championship, I think it's tough for, for Johnny Glynn to start. Um, Scales right there. Like, you know, the game has moved on. And I think something you often hear with lads who, let's say, they go off to Australia for a few years. And granted, right, those boys might be living the best life when they're out there in terms of fitness, but they come back and suddenly the game has moved on, even at club level, and they're they're completely amazed. Like inter county, again, it's it's every year it's evolving, it's really moving on. I've absolutely no doubt Johnny Glynn's the fitness, he has the skill, but adapting to where the game is at at the moment, making the moves. You know, realizing that when he would have left, physicality obviously was a huge part of it. It still is, but the ball passing through the hand, you know, the run game and all these things are, you know, to the fore at the moment, really. So it's just adapting to that. Like nobody, nobody would ever doubt that Johnny Glynn um, has has the the skills. You know, has everything he needs to to you know achieve at this level um, as he's proven before. But it's just a matter of look. He's been out of the game for five years. He definitely is going to need time to get back into it. And to be honest, I would kind of see it as as a role that if he is part of the panel going forward for the summer with Henry Shefflin, it would be a case of obviously he brings great experience to the dressing room, but I would see him probably being more coming off the bench after 40 minutes maybe, or maybe starting and going, listen, get in there, you know, hit them hard straight away, put a bit of confusion into the defence, but, you know, he might last 45 minutes or something going really hard. It's hard to know. It's hard to know, but I, I think the earlier Galway get him back, the better. You know, the quicker you get him back there, you get, get him out in the field, um, and start exposing them to where the game is at at the moment, the better for Galway and the more they'll get out of them over the summer. Yeah, because it sounds to me, Scott, like I don't know what his work situation is in New York, but it has to be fairly unworkable, the idea of, say, coming back for a little window, then going back to New York, coming back for a window. If he's going to be playing inter-county hurling for Galway this summer, and bear in mind the championship will come around in four or five weeks' time, yeah. he probably has to commit to being home for quite a block. Like He'd have to be home for at least two months for this to actually work. Um, absolutely. And the thing is that I know there was an opportunity going back years, a few years back when he last played that he was able to work remotely. But I think he's actually, you know, elevated through his career. He's progressed in his career to take on more responsibility in his, in his respective role at work. So maybe that opportunity is not there, uh, that he has to be more, you know, on site based. Um, but for me, I'm looking at him thinking like he he needs, he's the type of guy that's always been physically in pristine condition. He's always had you know, the, the high ball capability. But no more than myself, he just needs hours on the ball wall or hours on the pitch to... Uh, to get the touch up, you know, and like with the way the game is, the speed has just, it's it's gone to a different level. So I'm wondering, can he get the hours in, you know? But then I started breaking it down and I was saying to myself, <clears throat> Murphy, if we were in a, in, a, in a summer and I said, right, could you get sharp at hurling in six weeks? You get fairly sharp, you know what I mean? Yeah, you would, yeah. And I, I broke it down and said, if you train three times a week on a pitch and minus warm, see, that's three hours a week, you could say, solid. That's only mm. 18 hours of, of work that gets you, gets you up to a good level. So, there's, there's plenty of hours a day. Can he get up to a certain level, you know, where he becomes a, an asset, you know? And I, I think, I don't think he'd start, actually. I think he'd come in at, at the latter stage. You know, if you're if you're a tired fullback or a tired wingback and you see this, this behemoth coming on top of you, it's not, yeah. it's, not, it's not ideal. It's not ideal to have him coming after you. And especially in the way the games are now, nowadays, like, you know, you could have a situation where you're potentially chasing again, you know, and that what better man to bring in for, for a long ball tactic than Johnny Glynn. So the question for me is, can he get the time? in Ireland is one can you get the time on the pitch and having the hurl in the hand is two and let's say what what do you what do you do with him then when he gets to a certain level is three but uh, thankfully they're not questions for me to answer I don't get paid for that they're not <laughs> so I, was, I was going to put to you Scal, how often do Galway actually look to play with a bear in the square type I would have thought that Galway <clears> with the way their forwards are set at the moment you'd probably want Two corner forwards who want to get as much space as they possibly can. You'll withdraw some of your players back. Like it's not yeah. like Galway aren't stacked in the forward line right now because you are. Well, they are stacked. Like if you remember, cast your mind back to last year, like we were commenting on how Conor Whelan was always having to contest the ball coming into him. Maybe, maybe the quality ball wasn't hectic. Uh, he wasn't. We weren't utilizing his runs as much, and he wasn't getting the ball in free space. And when you have a forward of his capability, you want him to have the ball uncontested. Nearly have a 70-30 advantage. So if if they're still going to play in that way you know, Johnny Glynn's an ideal man to have in there. And what about having Conor Whelan work off him? So if you have the option to go into a corner to Conor Whelan or long to Johnny at 14, you you just don't know what you might create. Because the guy of his size, let's say, you, you, I know I use the word a bit, but you do create a small bit of pandemonium when you have someone like him because his ability, to, his aerial ability is, is unreal. And 
you want to get a true feeling of it. Morph, you know what he's like. He's I, I commented this before, like his wingspan and arm reach is so vast, right? That even if you're the full back, like let me see, Mike Casey, even him when he's hurl up full in the air, Johnny could still nearly reach above him. Do you know what I mean? It's that he's that large. So I just think the opportunity would be the the, the amount of opportunities that you could create would be more with Johnny if he's partnered by someone like a Connor Whelan. Um and I think that's probably where you put him because I it's hard for, for me to see him in like a you know a Hegarty role, uh, whereas you see the deep line wing forward or you know, because Galway's game at the moment seems to be with Joseph Cooney, Tom Monaghan, and Gavin Lee mm. kind of moving around the middle third and shooting from distance. And that not, that's not really Johnny's Johnny's go to. So I'd say if we're going to see him anywhere, we'll see him as the bit in the square. It's <laughs> interesting. Okay. Let's hold on, see where this goes. It's an intriguing story. The only thing is, before we move off this, Kel, are you officially willing to remove him from your one per county at this point and we accept he's not playing for New York? <clears throat> Jesus. It's like, when we, it's like when I play hide and seek with my daughter, right? She hides in behind the curtain, okay? And I can see her legs, but she thinks I can't see her. So I'm not, so like that's, I'm playing that game. Well, I'm just doing this. I'm not answering the question. We're moving on, all right? <laughs> Next question. You can't see me. He's still do in my team. Next. Do we do we let him away with it, Murph, until he actually walks out, out onto the pitch with Galway? Is that the point when it goes well, beyond return? Well, not by the way Skell was talking at the start of this. Like Skell just said, like, I even said Henry said that he's back for a week's training. He's not on the panel. Skell was talking in present tense there. He was saying <laughs> Johnny is back. Wasn't expecting it a whole lot. The only time he actually went back on that was yeah, it was at the end where you're like, oh shit, I have to take him out of the team. So no, I think I think by the way you were talking there, Skell, now that's it done. It's out. Either your team is out or you may take Johnny Glenn out. Do you know what? We we'll go with fourteen. We'll take. We'll still take you. Out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still take you out. I'm. I'm willing to give you time. Maybe by the time the members pod rocks around, you can find another player from another county that you want to put in True. in his position. I another Galway lad sent off from the weekend. Anyway, we we'll just we we'll just include him. Shots right? fired. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Oh, okay. Oh. That's all right, Murph. I feel warm yeah. after that, but now it's yeah. coming, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're fine playing with 12, so we'll be fine. Maybe Skell can put 12 in his team. Uh, this is the Hurling Pub, by the way, uh, which is brought to you by Borgosh Energy. They are the proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Uh, the weekend has just gone by. It has possibly taken away some of the drama ahead of the last weekend. But as I mentioned in the intro, particularly when it comes to Division 1B, it's going to go right down to the final minute of those matches this coming Saturday. Because despite the fact that it's a double header now in Galway, uh, will know what Tipperary will have to do at full time because they will know what's happened with the result between uh, ostensibly Limerick's home game but the game that's happening in Salt Hill. If Galway win, they could snipe in on the last day and it would come down to scoring difference with the three counties if all three are um, on, what would it be, six points at the end of it. So, oh, sorry, eight points because it would have yeah. all won four, yeah. So that's all kind of in the balance and Clare especially now going to play against the Scratch Offley team because the Offley manager, Johnny Kelly, said after the game today, he's using his panel for the last game. It's a dead rubber for them. Clare have already put themselves into a semi-final, so they'll be looking to just secure a top spot. And then we'll see what happens with the teams who are below them to see who's going to take the second semi-final spot. But when we break it down for this weekend, I think probably the live match lads on the telly on Saturday is the way to start, which again, uh, continues this crazy record that Limerick have in winning second halves against Tipperary. So uh, Tipperary are still waiting for a win against Limerick, which hasn't happened uh, in six years now at this point. But it was Colm Key's stat, which again stood out, which I'm sure you guys saw over the weekend. I'm going to quote him absolutely directly so that I don't get this one wrong. But Limerick have dominated these second halves against Tipperary, and that's... Uh, trend has continued which is probably the fairest way of putting it in the weekend's just gone by and they just can't buy one so better look to the scoreboard for tip directly quoting from column here at the end but they're now 13 games where they haven't won a second half against john kiley's limerick before halftime limerick are 26 points down across those games and after halftime it's limerick plus 74 that's a, that's a trend murph that you just can't ignore yeah and i suppose it's um it's exacerbated by the fact that, that Tip, Tip have been in good positions, I suppose, against um, against Limerick down through the years, particularly the Munster final in Parky Cueve. I think that's kind of where this stat really came out of initially. I remember seeing this maybe about a, no, well, maybe two years ago, uh, and it came up. But you know, Tip, in fairness to him, there's 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 two ways to look at it. One, 
Tip have gone at Limerick really well in first halves, but why... No, do you know what? I will temper it with saying that what team have really done well against Limerick in the second half? Bar Clare, let's say, Munster finds Clare beating them down in the Gaelic grounds. Clare are the only team that have really done well um, from what I can think of against uh, against Limerick in second halves. Granted, I know what Galway bet them early last year, was it, in the Gaelic grounds? But we've kind of picked Tipperary out as the team. Now, Look, that record is it speaks for itself. Tipperary have been in positions to go and maybe beat this Limerick team. Do I put that down to Tipperary not executing it or Limerick being that good? I put it down to Limerick, to be honest. Um, I don't put it down to necessarily Tip completely crumbling. It's just that this, this Limerick team know how to go up through the gears. Like I was watching the game at the weekend, and one thing that struck me was I was watching, I was looking out for different things, the way the game was panning out, and I kind of stopped watching the scoreboard. And when I look back up, Limerick had gone out into a two or three point uh, lead, but it didn't feel that way. It didn't feel like that they were, you know, if you were to ask me to score, I'd say, oh, there's it's a draw or maybe there's a point in it. But for all the really good hurling Tipperary we were doing, I think it was a reflection that Limerick uh, at their ease were getting scores, whereas, you know, Tipperary were really having to work and, and they did really well. They did a lot of good stuff. But I just think it's Limerick's ability to be so efficient in what they're doing that they just start coasting, coasting and they just get up through the gears. And before you know it, They've pushed out in front of you by four or five points. That's not taken away from the stat. It's 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 an amazing stat. But I just I I wouldn't be as hard on Tipperary in this stat as it is. I think it's really just a reflection of yeah. the capability of this Limerick team. Mm. What about that second half skill? Can we call a spade a spade? This game is pretty shit. <laughs> no, we're using my language. That is a spade. <laughs> <laughs> It was. Um, it, no, it was, it was a poor game. Like, but like, I suppose across the television, it's very hard to get an understanding of the actual true, you know, difficulty of the conditions. You know, and I think what what, what makes Limerick uh, stand out an awful lot is, is their ability to use the conditions against the team. So you might look at last night and see the the way that Limerick set up uh, zonally. So that means then you can tip having the ability really to play space, have play a man. So that means your execution has to become perfect in a in a wet day. And if you ask if you ask me why are Limerick so dominant in second halves, is because I think. In first half, teams come with bundles of energy, new plans, etc. But in second half, in Limerick just completely dominate the opposition's puck out. So if you can dominate the opposition puck out, that allows Limerick to a uh, shoot as much as they want because they can turn them over in the puck out. But b it, it just it stems a platform for the opposition, and then you're you're kind of refined to to, to, to scraps and to, to half chances to, to try and get at Limerick. And the trouble is, let's say if you look at last night's game, you know. Tipperary were poking the ball out. Uh, Hogan was doing the best he could with what he was given. Um, and just Limerick just consistently turned them over. They won primary possession. There was no real situation where Tipperary could win primary against them. Limerick turned them over. They break in spades. I mean, they break like in five or six lads from, from a certain pocket. And I love the move that the likes of Hegarty and Morrissey do, whereby if a puck, an opposition poker comes down, someone like Conor O'Neill wins it in the halfback line, and Hegarty runs to his own goal, O'Neill pops it to him. And whatever it is with the psyche, the opposition, they just seem to back off Hegarty. They seem to head back towards their goal to cover. Then Hegarty has loads of time to, 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 to fire into space. How many times did we see Morris do that last year? Like, on team on times, and teams just can't can't notify it. And it's little like intricacies like that whereby they make getting top of your book out. They do a little kind of certain, I call it a stage run with, with, with a Morrissey, with a Hegarty, etc. Creates an opportunity inside, and you've got great finishers. Now you've got... Adali, I hope that's how you pronounce his name perfectly. Mm. Uh, Casey, Galan, Flanagan, and you know you, you bring on people who are extremely effective. I think the, the stat was there that the four subs scored last night. So if you've got a team that is a dominate the puck out, b is is delivering to players that like even though the substitutions come in, there's no drop in quality, and c extremely efficient. Like it's it's very hard for a team to win at that at that rate. And I don't think anybody else um, in the country, well, I, I, I know nobody else in the country has the panel strength that Limerick have. Remember a couple of years ago, we were questioning the panel strength. Is that, is that a possibility? That's dead in the water. They have, they have a strong, real strong 25 that no matter who's in there, you know, the train keeps on moving. Mm. Murph, to use one of Skell's phrases, a bolter. Donico Dalek is a bolter here because yeah. we were all getting ready. Colin O'Neill was the man in waiting. He was going to be the guy who worked his way into that forward line. Eventually, you know, someone was going to break through and it was going to be him. Now you've got a Dalek who is free scoring throughout the league so far this year. Uh, got themselves a couple of points from play when Limerick weren't scoring from play in the first half at Porky Cueve last night. And it seems that maybe number six might be something that they work longer term with Carl O'Neill. Uh, like, what was your take on, before no, we talk no. about Odal a little bit more, what was your take on how he played at six now that we've seen 
two matches. Uh, it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't convince me to, not to go with Hannon still. Like uh, I, I still go back to saying with Hannon is oftentimes you don't notice Declan Hannon is there because he's just doing his job so well. But there was times last night, and I will put this down to you know early stages of the league. Um, he, he's obviously there because he's a great uh, distributor of the ball. You know everything else also. But like I, I see that they have him there looking to spray good ball into the forwards, which he's well capable of doing. But there was times where, you know, maybe just taking the wrong decision. Now, this is this is me being like, you know, really looking for things to be critical of, because when you were looking at him, you were saying, is he doing a better job at the moment than Declan Hannon? You'd be saying no. But Declan Hannon has enormously high standards to, to try and get to. I think if Declan Hannon was injured or if there was, you know, another player injured, it's certainly an option. Uh, and I, I think they're trying to force... To try and find an area for Cahill O'Neill. Like Cahill O'Neill's thing nearly is that he's been he's been really good in so many areas, half forward, midfield, trying him at centre back. Now, I would still be going with Declan Hannon. Uh, does he then slot into midfield? I don't think so because the two lads midfield are going really well. So it's it's kind of a it's it's a tough situation. Well, not a tough situation. It's a situation every other team in the country would love to be in. But decision making wise and everything, Hannon is still ahead of Cahill O'Neill there because Hannon has the experience in the area, and I don't see at the moment, maybe give it time, maybe give it a few more games and I can see, okay, Carl O'Neill really getting comfortable there. But not yet have I seen an indicator that that would be long-term. Now, look, Declan Hannon, far be it for me to say, like, I mean, Declan Hannon, is, the, is he the oldest? No, but Barnick Quaid, he's the oldest outfield player from what I think of. I think he's 30. I mean, again, plenty of years left under, potentially down the line. But at the moment, if Declan Hannon is fit, Declan Hannon plays there and, and Carl O'Neill moves. Um so I, I don't see it. I don't see it just yet because look what what, what a centre back you have there in the first place. Yeah, I suppose Gal, if you want to be hypercritical, there were times when Tipperary looked to kind of bottle him up, uh, but generally when he got a chance to run, and maybe the, it'll be a case of just curbing these instincts a little bit. He was more than happy to play a pass, go again. He got up and took quite a few shots. Now Limerick weren't all that accurate, particularly in the first half, but. Certainly, O'Neill didn't look like a guy who was just going to sit back in the pocket. This is a guy who wants to drive forward as a number six. Yeah, like if, if, you, if you have someone like Cotton O'Neill who has the ability to drive forward, you have a, a numerical advantage in heading, heading, heading forward. You know what I mean? Someone who predominantly places Hurling as a forward, if he's able to win the ball primarily in the back, give it to a midfielder and go again, next thing you've got seven forwards and six backs, you know, it can, it can create opportunities as well. But I, I don't know, is that his role? Is that, is that the role of the Olympic six? Like, I, I think previously we'd have seen Declan Hannon would have drawn a kind of a if you like, an imaginary line across the opposition 65 and wouldn't have passed that. That's, that's what he's done. He's popped points in that range before, generally, centrally. He's, he's, his main role, and Murphy makes a good point about how he's, he's seamless in, in his kind of transitioning from, from play from back to forward, is that uh, he, he just does the, the, the simple things well. He's there as getting turned over. Ever. I don't ever see him getting turned over. He rarely gives the ball away uh, in open play, but Last night, let's say, Cahal did give it away. I just think he's new to the position. I don't know what position he plays for his club, but it looked like to me last night that he was kind of, you know, trying trying to learn as he went along, which is he's fully granted. Like, he's probably thrust into that position by Kylie, uh, which is a great, it's a great sign in itself, like someone of, of you know, the, the level of Kylie Knurk and, and them as say, right, we're going to trust you in at number six, have at it. You know, it's, it's a great sign in itself that his ability must be, you know, off the charts, even beyond what we've seen publicly. But mm-hmm. I, I think for him, like, I'd say he's going to be at, at a minimum midfielder forward. I, I don't see him come the championship time if, if like Limerick have their full complement, him being the halfback line. Because you have to remember that like last night, Limerick are missing. Let me off the top of my head now: Finn, Nash, Hannon, Hayes, Donovan. Do you know what I mean? Didn't start Morrissey. Didn't start Flanagan. You know, so they've got a plethora of people to come in. And like when you have all those people available, I just I I, I see it very hard for for the likes of uh, Colin to play at six. So I imagine we see him in the forwards again. Yeah, the injury update, by the way. Uh, so this was John Cody to say, Porky Cueve, after the game. So Sean Finn, Declan Hannon are back in full training. Uh, he says he's waiting for the right opportunity to return to action. So maybe they won't be risked against Galway uh, next week. Kyle Hayes making good progress on an ankle injury that he picked up in training. And Darrow Donovan picked up a small bit of a sprain, so it's being rested. So it would seem that uh, that's basically a few first-team players there are right back in contention uh, for Limerick by the end of the league and going round to the first round of championship against Clare. Also for Clare, uh, I spotted Shane O'Donnell and uh, Tony Kelly. Some people have photos of them doing a bit of a kind of a, a, a warm down, an activation, whatever you want to call it these days in Ennis. They weren't involved in the match day panel, but it would appear that they're now coming back. And particularly with Tony Kelly, that is significant to say he's nearly coming back. Something that was also significant, Murph, during the game 
as I said, there was a real stop-start feel to it and, and the freeze didn't help. And we will talk about referees because there are so many of the questions that have come in in comments are about the refing standards across the weekend. But when Jason Ford puts the ball in the net, Limerick get the next four scores. When Tipperary scored their second goal, when Bonner Mara scored, Limerick get the next four scores. That's the one thing that will maybe eat away at Tipperary is they didn't kick on after those two goals. Taking the Morris one out of account because it was the effectively the last puck of the game. But for the other two goals that they got... Tip just couldn't use that as a platform. No, and like to be honest, you know, it was great that Tip got the goals for them, but Limerick weren't badly set up for the goals either. You know, like Jason Ford's goal, um, Limerick have enough lads back. It's just really, I suppose, a bit of individual play. And a flick of a flick of a hurl there might have got to the ball at some stage. And the defenders didn't do a whole lot wrong. You look at Bonner Mars goal again, geez, a great goal. Um, didn't give up on the ball, turns it over, you know, a great sidestep and buries it. Uh, and Jake Morris's goal as well. So like Limerick didn't do a whole lot wrong, but I just think it's it's inbuilt into these Limerick lads' heads that um, you know they, when they get a sniff of a team getting a purple patch, they just shut it out. They just kill it. They choke it dead, and they go back up the other end and start getting scores. Um, it's like a reflex for them. You know, there's there's no message coming in from the sideline. There's no kind of uh, major signal happening. They just know themselves that you know a team hits the back of the net. We haven't seen a team hit the back of the net three times against Limerick. I think since 2017. I think it might be. Um, do, you want, do you want to guess who the two teams were that scored three goals against them? Uh, you, you, you won't guess this unless you've heard it already today. Okay, the two teams that scored three goals against them. Oh, do you want to have uh, a goal, Skell? What year? Well, give 20, me a clue. 20, 2017, 20, League 1B. <laughs> give me a clue. I just said 2017, 30 yeah. seconds ago. <laughs> pretty, pretty sure it was in 1B. <laughs> okay, let me think now. So we, are you thinking we won't get this? Westmead? I, I, I think it's tricky. I think you'll either I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, won't. Uh, Wexford? No, not West Westmead Mead. either. No, Cork actually. No, she just keeps saying team scale. Good man. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're nearly there. So <laughs> five teams left here that would have played in Division uh, One that year. Division One. Galway. No, I give up. I, I, I'm sick of this. I give up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. O- Offaly and Kerry. Ah, well, sweet baby Jesus, I never got that. But they Jesus were. But also, around. I think they were the two games where Limerick weren't exactly going at yeah. it as hard as they would normally have gone. I just I remember yeah. the Offaly game and I saw John Kiley's quotes earlier, which is where Kerry had come up on it. So you wouldn't mm. in a month of Sundays you wouldn't have guessed that unless there was probably more clues. But <laughs> no. Um uh, I, yeah, I, I suppose I'm with Murph on this one, Skell. They weren't exactly so two of them are turnovers and kind of individual mistakes. You probably wouldn't argue that it was a structural issue, say with the Limerick defence, that no. everyone would have been looking at that and thinking we're going to get at them. No. Yeah, well, so there's, there's the three goals you can imagine. Um, so obviously we have the first one on the sideline. I was trying to think back over the last number of years, uh, specifically from 18 onwards, quite a six seasons. Have I ever seen that type of goal scored against Limerick? The first one? No. Have I ever seen the second one scored whereby kind of, let's call it a very uh, lackadaisical approach by Colin Cockton to a pickup up uh, and a turnover goal? No. And have I ever seen a goal from Limerick that whereby they work a sharp pick out and they get turned over in their own half and it results in a goal? No. I can't think of any of them goals, those three that we have seen uh, in the past. So that that's kind of a major structural efficiency. Um, but I just, again, I put it down to what, what Murph said. It's early, early league form. I yeah. do not think that's going to happen at all in championship. Um, so I even listened to Kylie's interview. Um, it's it's like that sometimes, you know, the are so impressive at times that it's it's nearly a positive in Kylie's mind, although he won't show publicly that he has something to go and go back and beat them with. If you know what I'm trying to say, you know, this, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is very, you know, off the court, this is very poor of, of our standards. This is not what we're about. Now we have to mm-hmm. go and, and fix it and go harder again. So I think that's that's exactly what he uses it for. He uses it as, as, as kind of fodder for the next um, seven days training. And unfortunately, they've got Goy next. And the other, the, other, of best players. <laughs> the other side as well is that, you know, penalty in the first half, really, that they didn't get, which, you know, there wasn't much shouting about it. But was it Gillan was fouled? It looked like a penalty. It looked like he was inside the box. Was inside? It looked well, like it? Ah, it was border. I mean, look, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have he, given out a whole lot if there was a penalty given. He, you know? he lands the goal side of the line, is what I would mm. argue there. Now, whether I think um, the way it was argued on the TV, so obviously Jerry Canning and Michael Dygan were talking, but they both, I think, felt it was a penalty as well. It felt like maybe the initial foul on Galan was outside. And Galan obviously does kind of fall forward as well, so yeah. that influences where he lands. But, I mean, he lands the other side of the line. It should have been a pen. And there's an argument it could have mm. been a black card as well. Yeah, well, I think if there's any doubt, like, I mean, again, we were looking at it a few times and we we're still in doubt. Like, in the moment, look, just give the penalty and, and on you go. Um, considering what other, I know we'll get on to the referees, considering what other frees have been given for over the weekend, I thought that was, if Can games were you? being if games were being let flow, you'd go, okay, it was in the spirit of the way the game has been let flow. But 
a lot of stuff was being called up. So I was like, mm. that, that, I thought that was a very clear penalty in, in the, I suppose, in the tone of how the freeze were being called over the weekend. Can I ask you a question? You know Jason Ford's goal? So he takes yeah. 12 steps on that. What's your okay. thoughts on this? I know he, I know he's been I know he's been let's say held and kind of pulled and held up if like but like what's your thoughts on like when when a guy basically two wrongs don't make a right yeah yeah like yeah. Should, is is the advantage I I I can understand the advantage is given but why do you give an advantage when there's another foul being committed by the person who the original foul is being given again it's hard to explain do you know what I'm saying yeah I know what you Ford's, mean yeah four is yeah. taking twelve steps should not be pulled back and given you know as a penalty the reason he's taking so much steps is because he's held is that right. But you know what? I didn't even cop that he had taken 12 steps. So, like, I mean, that's not something that initially popped into my head. Do you know what I mean? When you're looking at a situation unfold. Often, oftentimes, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought I should have been free out, to be honest there. I thought he was fouling, the, <laughs> fouling my Casey. But uh, I didn't actually cop first time around. Like, you can only look for a certain amount of things during play. So let's say the ball lands in, he catches it. I'd say the referee was looking to see, right, is he being fouled? Is he fouling? Is, is the arms up around the head? Like, you can't also then always watch for steps as well. That might sound a bit silly. You might sound a bit, I don't know, maybe maybe you can. But I, in the moment, wasn't going right forward after taking too many steps there. I was actually looking to see, was he being fouled? Was he going to get a shot away? What's the story? And to be honest, my feeling was at the time that, yeah, well, like, I mean, if he was fouled, you know, just blow it back. You don't, don't, you can't yeah. let someone off with 12 steps. And, like, funny enough, if you look at the Claire Kenny game, like, Adrian Mullen, something similar, was fouled uh, in the first half, was fouled in the first half, and... James Owens blew it up when he was popping it to TJ and TJ was true on goal. And like at that stage, as a Kilkenny person, you were going, oh, geez, let it play on. But Adrian had taken a lot of steps as well. So kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't in lots of ways. People mm. want to see the game play on. There's almost an unwritten rule where if a fella is being quite clearly fouled and he's after standing over the four steps, he's nearly given automatically compensatory three or four, four steps on you go, just play it on, will you? Nobody speaks about it, but it, it is kind of nearly in the game. So I... If I'm trying to look at it in a balanced view, I, I shouted at the telly when James Owens blew it up for Adrian Mullen, passing it off to TJ. But, Jay, but Adrian had probably taken about 10 steps, do you know, in the yeah. same way with, Jay, with, with the Jason Ford run. But look, what I would say automatically, first first time looking at Jason Ford's goal, I didn't actually even tweak that he was after taking a lot of steps. Defenders Union, you should have been all over that. You should have been saying <laughs> he's anything more than three... 100% blow this up Defenders Union as well Murph uh, would you have felt for Ronan Barr when he comes out with the ball and he ends up getting booked for barging uh, it wasn't a yellow I, I, I wouldn't be giving a yellow for it anyway um, it, like Ronan Barr kind of it's a situation where look I mean he's coming out He's you, he has his own momentum I he's can't remember welcome, who he's, to be fair he's welcoming the contact is what I yeah, would say yeah he is welcoming the contact like it's, it's it's a dark art to be honest is what I'd say he wasn't going to cause any injuries he himself, you know, you're talking about right away. He himself was driving out with the ball and he was being closed. Um, I don't think it was yellow. Like, that's the first I'll say. Free in, yeah, okay. Like, I mean, he came out, he barged. Oh, no, like, I'm not saying, like, I mean, leave it at a free in. If you're going to leave it, it's free in, but no need to book the man. But I think in that situation, he's coming up. There's a collision. Limerick man doesn't go down soft. Let him let him out with the ball. Let him play on. Because it's like we're getting too much into the into the weeds on these ones um, from, from a blowing them up point of view. I... I didn't see a whole lot wrong with it straight away. I was actually kind of happy to see a nice bit of contact and maybe it might, I suppose, ignite the game a small bit. But uh, no, it definitely wasn't yellow. It was very harsh, the whole thing, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know, Skell, whether there was some kind of dictate that happened in the last week or during one of the two breaks here that went, pull up as many potential fouls as you possibly can. But there was also the one where Jason Ford comes in on Keen Lynch and Keen Lynch goes down. And you can just see how annoyed Ford is that it felt like it was, from his point of view, a fair hit and a free was given. But like across the weekend, there were a lot of frees that kind of left the crowd not particularly happy, I would say, across a few of them. Yeah. Did it feel like a few of them were too soft? I know Eddie Brennan was saying at the weekend, it almost feels like it's going to non-contact with some of the frees that were actually given. Well, there's a couple of things here. And um, first of all, I think from from a technical perspective, like it, when a technical free is given away, like a, you know, a chop or... The clear, the clear freeze, you know, three catches, etc. We said before that's not an opinion-based decision. You know what I mean? That's that's a clear decision whereby the, the referee has a hundred percent knowledge. I have to give this free, right? I couldn't really grasp what way the referees were kind of what they were looking for. Um, was there consistency in all their decision making? Because in the games I watched, obviously Tipperary and Limerick, I watched uh, Wexford and Washford, and I watched Kilkenny and Clare, 
And the three performances were chalk and cheese, if you ask me. I, I couldn't, there was no real rhythm to the, re, the way the referee's looking for. It. And it's like it was all opinion based refereeing. There was no kind of, how do I say, specific set of rule books, rules book around, and it's all around the tackle, if you ask me. Because, and I, I and I, as well, I will say, I, I know the referees get a hard time, and sometimes it's richly deserved. But as well, some of the teams nowadays, the tackling is really poor. Like, it's really, really bad. And I don't know, is it because of the conditions, the pitch, the weather? You're not just being up to sharpness, but a lot of this is lazy arm dragging, hurls up around the neck, etc. And we have no choice but to give to give freeze against them. So that's one side of it, but not all of it. The other side of it is what really annoys me is the fact that referees keep getting sold on these freeze that have been bought. Do you know what mm. I mean? Yeah. So like when you when you when you've, when you've played the game, you understand let's say when a, when a guy is buying a free. For example, if if a forward is running to the ball, he grabs your hurl and falls over. Now he's after buying a free, like it looks like you're after getting contact. And what's happening now a lot of the days is that the, the guys are getting cute and they're trying to buy the freeze. But what's vexing is referees are falling for it. Even though you might identify this as the referee beforehand. Like I remember vividly last year, I said something to a referee in a club game. This lad is going to do this in, in the game. He's buying the free. And lo and behold, first time he did it, he fucking bought the free. Free. Do you know what I mean? Even though I, I kind of informed him. So it's like, it's like, um, I, it's hard to explain that the, the referees are, 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 are getting oversold and they're not, they're not thinking in real time. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know, are they, they being given a brief? Okay, let's clamp down on this today. Let's clamp on that, that tomorrow, etc. But there seems to be no consistency. And it's very frustrating for the public, people at games. And like, you look at the Galway game today. I didn't see the game, mind you, but there, there was an, an, an immersive amount of cards. And I don't think any game that, that is not so-called a dirty game would warrant all those cards. And like, on the run and matter side of things, it's not a card. I think he checks his run because if he keeps going straight, he's going to get contact. He's going to get bottled up by the limited anyway. I think he checks his run and... You know, it's unfortunate. I don't want to see that go out of the game. I don't want to see physicality go out of the game at all. I want to see those hard challenges, do you know what I mean? Uh, and and kind of use the body. It's the hurdle stuff that, that really kind of creates a bit of confusion. And even, there was one today, Mark Jim or TJ, he went to go flick the ball away in, in the in the first half. Yeah, it was a dive, yeah. a dive, a dive by the clear man because he sold himself, right? Free. And you're like, geez, that must be so frustrating for Kinney. Because again, they got sold. But I don't think we could be, we could be here in five years time talking about referees and it'll be the same thing. Because just I don't know, is the game too fast for them, respectfully speaking, mm. or is is that we're not we're not giving them a clear set of parameters to 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 officiate? It's, look, it's hard to tell. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of questions coming in about the referees. Um, Nessa saying, given the appalling refereeing we saw this weekend, what would the guys think about a GA center of excellence for referees? Uh, we got quite a few asking about. You know, what about the idea of, say, referees going full-time to try and improve the quality? Patrick Hickey said, do you think the GA should be trying to recruit full-time referees? Standards, in my opinion, seem to be getting worse in the last number of years. I know on the Instagram we had a couple of questions of a, a very similar variety saying, is there a way of actually improving the standard of refereeing? So just one... Yeah, our premier, sorry to interrupt you. Are premiership soccer referees full-time? They surely are. They, they are now, yeah. So they moved away from it. Ooh. I'm gonna say David Ellery was probably one of the last ones. Remember, he was a he was a principal, I think, in one of the big public and schools in the UK. And then, would you, would you, you guys know, agree with me? They're not really man, up to scratch either. Was your man Howard Webb? Was he not a policeman? I know we're getting off point here. Now. Oh, was I think Howard Webb. Yeah, Howard Webb might have been policeman. They're they're gone yeah, full time. Yeah. My my question being is like they're not really up to scratch. They they have plenty of controversy as, as well, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, on, a much, on, on a much slower game, if you ask me, hmm. a much a much well, smaller field, so. Well, if they went professional then, so Murphy, give you first shout, would it actually improve the quality of refereeing? And bear in mind as well, I know referees around the country who've been asked about the idea of going professional and they said they wouldn't actually be attracted to it, that the idea of, say, having to give up the day job to become a professional referee wouldn't appeal. So there's there's that side to it. But would standards actually improve if, say, these referees were full-time concentrated on being reps? I, I, I don't believe so um i don't think look first of all i don't think it's actually a realistic thing we can do in the ga at the moment because i mean that's how many referees are you talking about being professional and um, is it just the inter-county people and then then you're just putting them down to that's like, like you're saying that's just their job i actually think a lot of these lads prefer having a day job as well like i mean my opinion would be these you know referees want to get into referee and first of all they want to be involved in the ga they, they see themselves that they you know can have a positive impact on the game and so on and it's you know it's a thankless job for so many referees it is a thankless job i think a lot of them you know having their work is an is an escape would you be a full-time referee um the culture within the ga as well and it has to be said as well like i mean we, we had a conversation was it only six months ago or so about the hardship referees get and it was a very big topic you know a year ago about how much hardship referees get like not only 
if people are talking about like and I do think the standard referee wasn't great over the weekend um, and I say that as a collective because I think there must have been something said about high tackles and so on but at the same time for for us as supporters there also has to be a culture shift a little bit as well because uh I would say unless you've actually refereed now I've never refereed a game I'd say it's actually a little bit harder than we think uh, and the parameters around in which you know they have to make decisions uh it's tough it is very tough um, that doesn't excuse anything over the weekend. Like we were saying, I, I do think that it was whatever was said over the last week or two weeks in terms of targeting certain frees because it was across the board and particularly the high tackle um, uh, and how soft they were given over the weekend seemed to be a point. But make a referee's professional, I don't necessarily see it. Like, like Skell, you were saying there, you know, we see it in the Premier League where they have millions to pump at this. Yet every week, I mean, even today, you look at, or getting off point with different with different sports, but you look at Man um, Man City and Liverpool, and like one of the last kicks of the game, the VAR they've everything, and there's still people debating whether it was a high foot and different things. It's very tough. Hurling's a faster sport, and there's a lot more. Like you involve the hurl in that as well, and the fact that you know the hurl can be slapping down and different things make you know there's there's so many more fouls that can happen in hurling. Um, I don't think it would improve it to be honest. Um, potentially where. To, to, I suppose to, to, to clear everything up is a clear definition or a, a more clear definition of the rules. And um, there just seems to be, you know, it, seem, it, it seems to be this thing the whole time of like, they dial up one rule and say, right, this rule now, this is, you know, the, the center of attention and we're going to call this, uh, you know, all day long for the next two or three weeks. And that disappears and there's a different rule in and yeah. it's just inconsistency. It's so inconsistent. Um, like a big one there over the weekend that I saw was, and the first one, the first time I saw it was Jason Ford with, I think it was Cahill O'Neill. Uh, Cahill O'Neill went over Rose Ball. Jason Ford was going after him. He starts to hurl at hip height. As Cahill O'Neill is progressing, he raises his hands up. Naturally, Jason Ford's hurl, he can't get it out of there, is now gone up to shoulder height with, with Cahill O'Neill. And it, it's a free out for a high tackle. And he didn't, he didn't do a high tackle. It, it wasn't, you know, but that was blown because obviously... Liam Gordon was looking for that foul because I feel that that was something that had been said. And I thought, okay, well, this is just after happening here. But I saw it throughout the rest of the games and consistently through the rest of the games, you know, I saw this tackle of Skehill, kind of mentioned it earlier. Players looking for it. Players grabbing the lad's hand and the, per the player can't do it, can't pull their hand away, can't pull their hurl away. But it's actually the person that gets the free is the person instigating the issue here, is the person yep. that's grabbing on. Mm -hmm. And it happened across the board. But... Because players know that referees are going to blow for that, players are looking for it. Players are going, okay, well, well, if, if I can get the hurl up here, the referee is going to have to blow a free for me. And then, you know, it's a tap in. Whereas to discourage that, you know, if, if you stop blowing it and you, you blow a lot up for traveling, because, you know, if he's standing there and he's trying to play for a free, he's going to travel. Um, and then you give a free for that. Well, well, that kind of discourages that, that, that type of, um, that type of free. But, Look, I know I'm gone long winded there, but I, I don't think going professional will, will will get rid of any of these issues. Um I think clarity between players, between referees, um Scale, you said a few years ago, like you know, referees used to come into the dressing room, you used to get whoever it was used to come into ye. Um I think more communication between referees and players. Like uh, uh, the, the extent of the communication I would have had as a player would have been, you know, the captain going up for the toss, coming back and say, Listen, lads, no mountain to the referee. If you you know, if you grab the jersey, it's going to be a free in. And you get three rules given to you that are going to be the 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 main rules for that day and you try and avoid them. So I think great communication between that, but also the last point I would say is just that uh I, I just think the culture around refereeing it's so tough. It's so tough. You know, one 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 time we're saying that you know, referees have a very tough job. The following time, we're absolutely hounding them as well for, you know, having a bad weekend. Um, there's no there's no uh, one pill that will that will solve this. And I don't think professionalism necessarily will solve it either. Yeah. Is, it, is it more evident in league games than in championship? It is, yeah. No, completely. Completely, yeah. Like, in league games as well, uh, like last night, and we even touched back to saying why, maybe why Cahill O'Neill found it tough at centre-back. Because it was rain and because it was, you know, tough weather, ball was heavy, um, you know, hurls are covered in rain and it's you're slipping around there's a lot more freeze there's a lot more lads getting dragged into dog fights lads getting dragged into scraps players falling it's tougher when you get into the summer hurling it's a bit more free flow the ball yeah. again is even moving faster you're, there's not as many rooks um so it does but it, it does seem to be a case though as much as as much as players are you know blooding themselves in the league referees seem to get blooded as well in the league in terms of you know they go and have their meetings they come back out and they're all on the same 
wavelength in terms of right lads were blown for this free each week that seems to be the tone of the league the whole time for, for as long as I'm watching Ireland that seems to be the tone of the league you know yeah there always seems to be instructions at some point you know like it was the hand pass again mm. a couple of times over the last two years where it was really clamped upon for a couple of rounds usually in the middle of the league and then yeah. by the time championship came around it wasn't really happening I did notice quite a few uh, thrown passes that were actually getting called across the weekend as well. So, yeah. again, I wonder if there was a bit of an instruction about that because I think some of them would have probably been let go normally. And it'd be interesting to see if, uh, especially what we saw at Porky Cueve last night, some of those passes that were being called, if they would get called if we were in the middle of the summer. But uh, Limerick track of Porky Cueve really good as well. They lost first round of the league there last year. But aside from that, it's a good record. I can see where they were happy enough to go down there to play against Tipperary and to get another one out there the record is good everywhere it is to be be fair I think on the moon the record will be pretty good Um, I'm I'm glad and we will get around to it tough places to go proved to be a tough place to go when Kenny lost against Clare today I'm thinking tough place to go for Limerick could well be going back to Ennis but let's uh, let's talk about that again Um, Galway if we can just kind of touch on the other two games in 1B before we jump across to 1A so um I don't know, Skell, whether this will feel like an opportunity missed for Dublin in the grand scheme of things, because Galway finished the match with 12 men, and Dublin conceded 10 scores without reply in the third quarter of the game. Like They got themselves into a pretty good position, so Donald Burke scores 1-9. They get to 1-13 after 50 minutes, but in the 20-plus minutes that followed, they only scored two more points. And Galway kind of coasted home in the end, 1-23 to 1-15. Conor Cooney with 11 points. I wonder, does Michal look back at this and think that was a really big opportunity there? Like, if you put yourself physically in the Galway shoes now, right, and you say you've only got 12 men, obviously 11 outfielders versus 14. H- how do you outscore Dublin? How, how, like, do you know what I mean? H- how do you, let's say, go on the ascendancy in that game? Like, it's hard for me to even envisage. Um, so I'd say Michal will be disappointed with the, with the reaction, if you like. Um, but if you get him, if you get him broiled in, in a kind of a tight game with Dublin, it's, they're hard to beat. And generally, those tight games occur in Dublin. So when it, when it occurs in Galway, a it's a surprise to me, and and b I'm kind of happy to see that, that we came out the right side of it, even though we had a numerical disadvantage. But I think there's a certain amount of opportunities that Michal is looking for to take down, you know, big teams. Let's call them the top three or four, five teams. And uh, this will probably be he look at as as being one of them because he looks like he's been looking for a spark, you know, to, to try and ignite this panel, ignite this group. And um, they fell out of the championship kind of fairly flat last year against Clare. And you were kind of hoping for better things, you know. There's been kind of negative press around them over the last three weeks, uh, particularly after the limit performance. And you were saying, right, here's the reaction now. Here's going to be the big game. And there was all signs of it actually up for about you know 45 minutes, but then they just petered out. And that's probably the most concerning part of it all for me, all is the fact that like they put up a fight for two thirds of it, but then when they had the the number of adventures, the fight the fight left them. So good for them to have Jordan Burke back. But again, we we're, I feel like we're singing the same tune as last year, as you can't depend on him. Because again, a shoot on site merchant, and if you're if you're working that way, you're working you know, to it to a, a short championship exit. So, look from a goal perspective, it's the job is done. Unfortunately, come with Limerick coming to town next week, you're missing two of your most important players in in a your captain and vice captain. So you're, you're you're hopeful that the likes of you know Cahill Manning can get back, Brian Cannon can get back, etc. Johnny Glynn can get back, and we we'll see what uh, what, what we can throw at them. But again, it's it's a very tough ask next week. So. I, as I sit here, I don't expect us to be in league semi-final, truthfully speaking. Okay. Uh, Ronan Hayes was sent off for Dublin as well, so they also didn't finish with 15 men in the end. But um, this is one of these where, I guess, look, it condemns Dublin almost certainly to be playing in Division 1B for next year. So we know that Galway are going to take one of the top three spots along with Tipperary and Limerick. So they're guaranteed a place in the top flight for next year. It, is it a bad thing for Dublin? And we'll get around to Waterford playing in 1B next year. Is it that big a deal? That they won't be mixing it with the top seven in the country. Um, it's not that big of a deal, no, but it's it's maybe a marker for Dublin to go, okay, they can indicate to their standards really dropping down at this stage. You know, they've probably existed, I suppose, for quite a few years with the top teams, um, without really taking any big scalps, without really, I suppose, making any big drives towards silverware. Um so maybe now this is a marker where they can actually identify to say, right, well, from the days of where Anthony Daly was and what he was working with and all the hope and promise, well, this is now a step down. And I think, to be fair, I know we'll get onto it. I think Waterford will look at that as well in terms of, like, I mean, across the board, we're not really showing huge signs here of actually kicking on compared to you go back five, six, seven years ago. So um, it's like, I mean, it's not doomsday stuff, but it's certainly stuff where Dublin can look at and go, okay, we're not headed in the right direction here. 
um, and assess what is the situation. Is it what's feeding in from underage? Is it the draw of people going to football? What is it? But we're certainly not competing at a level. And I mean, regardless of what you say there, coming, you know, playing a Galway team that are down to 12 men, you know, being still being bet by eight points is not a great reflection there either. So, look, it's it's a moment for Dublin certainly to take stock. Look, Michal who couldn't have done any more as far as I can see either. You know, he doesn't have a huge amount to work with there. But um, I just think that, yeah, maybe Dublin Hurling will just have to look at this and go, okay, this is a moment, a significant, a significant enough moment where we can see our levels are dropping here. And if we don't get a hold of it fairly quick, you know, it'll, it our stock may drop even further. Yeah, uh, the other game in 1B was a win in Mullingar for Westmead against Antrim. Uh, Joe Fortune, the Westmead manager, said pretty much straight afterwards, doesn't matter whether they beat Dublin or not next week. He said everything for their entire year is on winning the Joe McDonough. He said the only job he has this year is to win the Joe McDonough. So he saw this game as being a regression of performance by comparison, he said afterwards, compared to the Tipperary and Limerick games where they had played quite well. So despite the fact they came out by six points, he felt the performance was actually down on those two fixtures. Uh, but they are getting players back. And again, more of them were back this time around. Another of Scales former teammates, Davy Glennon, putting the ball into the net in the 60th minute for Westmead as they picked up their first win of the campaign. Again, David Williams, very important, scored eight points for them. Their captain from last year, Killian Doyle, uh, came on in the second half. So they've got Angus Clark to come back next week. You're starting to think they're just building nicely towards the Joe McDonough. Interesting to see what kind of team they put out next week against Dublin because Westmead feel that's still a dead rubber. Even if they get to four points, they're not going to be qualifying for 1A anyway. Uh, the other goal coming from Owen Keyes. Uh, the other point which was made by some of the Westmead players afterwards was that Antrim obviously have been rocked by not having, say, some of the Dunloy players this time around. Their panel has been heavily impacted by players who aren't there. Neil McManus's retirement, all this has kind of weakened the group of players that they have right now. But Antrim should have beaten Dublin in Antrim if it wasn't for a mistake right at the end of the game. So I don't know if we necessarily need to write them off and say that they're in massive trouble in the Leinster Championship before it even gets underway. But obviously Antrim have got a bit to do over the next few weeks. So... Uh, that was a one twelve to one eight lead for Westmead at half time, and they kind of kept that distance throughout the second half. And the end won by uh, six points. So that's Westmead up and running with a victory after uh, two good performances. That brings us around nicely to Murph. Tough place to go, <sighs> Ennis. Uh, Nineteen points to sixteen. Uh, Clare got that win. Uh, so Kilkenny, as you mentioned, won the last two All Ireland semi finals. Uh, last two All Ireland semi finals. Eleven years now since Kilkenny have got anything from Ennis, which again, isn't really that big a stat when you consider they don't play each other there every year. But this was a Clare team who kind of finished strongly enough despite Kilkenny having some chances themselves when the sides were locked at 16 apiece. And in the end, Clare got through by 19 points to 16. Yeah, look, Clare were really in control for, for quite a bit of the game. They started really well. Um, just, you know, when you com- compare the two sides in terms of the first 10 or 15 minutes, Clare really started with a, a lot of vigour. They were really going at Kilkenny. They were driving forward really well and actually creating a lot of space for, for the full forward line who were getting onto ball and were either taking on their men, getting fouled or recycling really well. That was, for me, what the, one thing that was really identifiable in the first 15, 20 minutes was just that they had those three options quite a bit. They were getting a nice few frees. Granted, you know, they're free-taking. They'll be looking at it saying, we hit a few wide. We even hit a few wide that went over the bar. So, like, there's there's a few things there where, like, they'll be saying, right, we need to improve there. But when you compare it with Kilkenny, you know, quite a few balls were going up into the forward line and they were just getting turned over. Clare were really well set up um, and Kilkenny just weren't making that ball stick when, when it was getting into the, towards, let's say, the full forward line and they weren't getting as much off it. So, look, at Kilkenny were chasing uh, quite a bit here in terms of Clare were really setting out the stall. But, like, Kilkenny came into it. Um, they had opportunities, certainly. Um, they created, you know, I suppose, decent enough goal opportunities as well. But, Look, there was a bit of there was a bit between the teeth here with Clare as well, and there was a nice bit of bite to the game as well. You have to say between that and between Waterford and Wexford, there was actually a nice bit of a tussle to it. You know, players were getting fairly fiery, and um, it was good to see that there was something on the line. But no, you'd have to say, in fairness, like Skehel, you said before we came on, like Kenny did have opportunities there where they maybe went for goal, and in hindsight, to look back and say, wait, well, if we took those points, we might have came away with um, with the result even at the end. But nevertheless. Clare kicked on. They got a few great points. Peter Duggan, great long-range point. Jeremy Ryan was pop- popping up as well. Um, and I said it last week. Like to be fair, I did say that I thought Clare, you know, in Ennis, um, you know, Derek. In fairness, as well, no more than Brian Lohan is giving players chances as well. 
But I just thought from the form that I saw with Clare uh, and how strong they have been in Ennis, you know, that I just thought they might pip them by, I think I said last week, two points or so. But um, look, they were, they were full value for money. I think Kenny will still be happy. I don't think Derek Ling will be overly disappointed with how the lads played. There's there's certainly things to improve on. Um but he can certainly point to certain areas where Kilkenny were shut down that it was really good defending by Clare. It was really good challenging and so on. I think both sides won't be happy again with the referee. And I think James Owens, in fairness, he, he had a few good calls, but I think there was a good few as well where it, it, you could hear the frustration from the crowd as well, you know, kind of stifled the game a little bit. And I, I wonder if this game might have actually opened out even more again if it wasn't a little bit stop-start. So, um, but look, you know, Clare full value for it and you could see even at the end what it meant to him like I mean it was in fairness it was right down to the last puck of the ball as well so um, look good game um, I don't think Kenny are savagely disappointed going home and I don't think Clare will be getting too ahead of themselves either like you know one more match one and, and move on yeah yeah I suppose, Gal, as you said, I just wore red come on. So TJ Reid, Mikey Butler both the kind of goal chances towards the end of the game you wonder if Kenny rather than trying to work for the goal I pop them over it makes it a bit more difficult from Clare but I'm giving a lot of credit to Clare for scoring. I think it was three points in injury time to pretty much just swing it in their own favour. Uh, yeah. Eamon Foody made a good save from TJ Reid particularly to uh, to win out that game in the end. Yeah, and I think the, of the goal opportunities, when it comes, I think the only clear-cut one for me was probably the Mikey Butler one where he got in. That's one where you say you got to keep going for the goal. But I was just asking Murph before, and like, is, you know, with 71 minutes in the clock, you're only kind of two, two three points down. You had, you had like four attacks could you, could you play the game and, and, and head for the points? It's, because the question we always ask, and mm. invariably it always ends up that, that they don't get the goal. <laughs> we go talking about mm. asking this question. But like I, I, I thought it was a really good contest, more if I agree with George Hartley. It was probably the, the contest of the weekend prior to the Wexford Water game coming on. And um, I was just really, I really, I was looking to see what, what Claire were going to do um, systematically. And I thought they got a, got a really good split with the likes of um, Galvin and Lowe in the midfield, who did an awful lot of the. You know, excuse the pun, donkey work. Like they did an awful lot of heavy, heavy, heavy load stuff, and they put so much pressure on Kilkenny in the middle third that the ball that was going to Kilkenny was so bad that like you couldn't ask much of Joe King Kenny or or Hedger, or even Owen Curry. If I'm not mistaken, Owen Curry's first position was when he got the point off that lovely Kenny pickup during the 26 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like someone, someone as invaluable as Owen Curry, you want him on the ball every second minute. And like Adrian Mullen, if you look at the pressure he was on. In terms of his shots, it's, uh, I think he's the same amount of shots as Jeff Fitzgerald in the game, but came away with far less. Like so, I just thought Clare's, Clare's work ethic and 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 balance in the middle was excellent. And then you, when you when you team that with the way that Duggan and Fitzgerald played together, where they come into midfield, they go out the back with, with half forward line, really good. So they, they had a great go go forward platform, you know, for shooting obviously, but then they had a great you know work ethic as well to assist the low ones, the Galvins, the Leans, etc. Uh, at midfield and what allowed in as well it gave you know David Reedy great opportunities to go laterally you see Richie Reed showing up on you know, on the sidelines with Reedy and like the three don't want your six really so I was looking to see that, that Duggan and Fitzgerald were going to say up and down the pitch into midfield and then he had Reedy going left and right and it caused the, the, the Kilkenny defence an awful lot of trouble and it didn't allow the likes of Smith uh, Smith and Rogers to get to get some ball inside so their structure was really, really good. And like when you add more personnel, more top level personnel, mind you, I don't know if you come into that, it only adds to it. But I think they've found two good lads. Like sometimes we don't give enough credit, you know, to, to people that don't play as well as Tony Kelly or Shane Dolan in the likes of Daryl Owen. Like, you know, and like same same with Lean, same with Dar- uh, Jim Jamie although he's there a couple of years. Like they they don't look like the top level intercounty hurdles, but they're doing a really good job that fits that clear team. So like I I, I think it's gonna be hard to push them out, really hard to push them out because what they're doing is benefiting the team so well and they're winning against big teams. So it'll be interesting to see how they go forward like and when the big names come back. Obviously, Shannon Dolan and Tony Kelly, they go in, but yeah. when others come back, are they getting in? You, like, I mean, like, who, who would you be saying? Um, what was your man? Ryan Taylor, isn't it? He was one. Uh, Meehan's another. Like, that that lads that, you, that were featured last year on the back of, you know, uh, kind of wing forwards, centre field. So I just think that they have a, they have a really good squad built, uh, mixture of youth and experience, and uh, they were full value, value for the performance. Um, Kikini, sluggish enough, I have to say, at times, more, they were, the hurling was, was was not as, as sharp as you'd associate with Kikini, but mm. again, a game at this magnitude, relatively low, but it'll, it'll bring them on. So, yeah, not a bad game all, all round. Yeah, just for you look at Kikini, for both of you, fashion watch, we were given out by Cork a few weeks ago, that jersey will never be worn again. It was said at the Cork County Board meeting. Apparently, it sold really well. So, what do we know about fashion if it sold really well? <laughs> but this Clare jersey that we got to see today, 
for me, Murph, this is a winner. I really like this blue jersey. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Well, like all blue is generally, you know, it works. It works. It's quite simple. But uh, no, it was really nice. Um, big fan of it. Yeah, I don't think it was. It was. It was for Michael Cusick. Was Corpus find it? Yeah. What you say? Big fan of it. Big fan. Go and buy it. Go and buy it. Oh Jesus Christ! You can't say anything. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm a medium-sized fan of it. So, <laughs> no, it was. It's a nice jersey, a nice match commemorated as well. Um, but yeah, sure. Probably the last time you see that jersey as well. I don't see them playing it again. Maybe they do have plans to play in it. But uh, no, yeah, nice jersey. Jersey watch. Well, design one similar to it. Scale, are you are you a fan or not a fan of this jersey? I couldn't care less. Will to be honest. Fair enough. <laughs> look at this. Look at. Is it a hot topic? No. <laughs> God Almighty! You know, you ask a quite simple question, but like, you know, I really like this. <laughs> Look, I thought after we took a, a monumental dump on the Cork jersey, and people were saying, "You guys have no idea what you're talking about. This jersey's cool, and the kids are going to love it." And then I see a jersey I actually really like today, and I think, "Oh, well, let's have a chat." No, fine. There are more important things to talk about. In fact, in your in your opinion, yeah. what's the nicest jersey in the country? Ooh, oh, uh, good. Underrated. Under, okay, go on, yeah. I like Wexford's current one. I like Tipperary's current one. Uh, I'll have to have a think about the other ones, but those two are, are particularly nice this year. Are we talking Hurling or are we just talking jerseys in general? Ah, you can have jerseys in general, but they're the two certainly of Hurling counties right now that I, I quite like. Hmm. Sligo jersey is always a great one. Yeah. Black. It's great. Um, I like Derry's red, red and white combo, but yeah. What jersey is nice now? What's your no, scale? You better have of course. Now, <laughs> this is like a, again, this is like a fatter ten moment. Of course, they're all lovely jerseys. But, uh, <laughs> um, I've nice always one. loved the Antrim one. Yeah, Antrim's a nice one. Yeah, yeah. What, white shorts or black shorts with Antrim though? That's the white. Question. White. Okay. I have to match the stripes in the jersey if you ask me. Mm, yeah. Do you know the only thing about it as well is I, I got an awfully jersey a good few years ago. I swapped it after a game and a fine, I, a fine jersey, no doubt. Go on. Yeah, it was actually it was one of them like do you know when you get a jersey, let's say that you you haven't you hadn't swapped before, so it's kind of then becomes your you know, you might have two cork jerseys, you might have two tipper, whatever, but now you have an awfully one. But I swapped it for a mead one when I was out in America. I swapped it with a lad for mead. And uh, that was that was a nice jersey. Now it was a it was good. It was a coloured one back. Uh, 2013, 2012, 13 it was a nice one. Mm, Should give it away? I didn't give it away. I still have it. It's upstairs. Oh, the meat one I'm talking about. I swapped the awfully one yeah for a meat one. I said, well, I have a better chance of getting an awfully one than I do a meat one. So, um, but yeah, ah, oh, geez, favourite jerseys. We might have to revisit that one. Yeah, I think Carlo was more worked with. Yeah, it's a, lot of, it's, it's a lot of colours to work with. Though. <laughs> it's a, a lot, lot of colours. Yeah. I, I think sometimes when they've gone with ones where it's a dominant color out of their red, green, yellow, and they got a bit, bit of white getting on there as well. Sometimes it works better when it's almost more of one. Yeah. But then again, I've heard Carlo fans who love the idea of having bits of green, bits of yellow, bits of red. I'm sure will look at everyone loves the smell of their own fart. I'm sure. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure they do. You you didn't give us one. You decided to just have a go, at Carlo. I said Antrim. All right. Sorry. It is okay. Antrim. Antrim. Yes, Antrim. <laughs> Take that back, yeah. William. Antrim. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I apologize <laughs> and I withdraw my criticism. Jesus, the answer so is nice. This is a tough, it's a, it's a hot and heavy pod. I'll give you that one. Yeah, Today's yeah. mother did. Actually, did you be out the mother today, G? Did you get the mother bouquet of flowers. Granted that she's my mother, she's on holidays, actually. So <laughs> that's, where, that's where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you send her on holiday at least? Are you. Uh, no, I didn't say. Oh, Jesus! No, she she um, she's got the peacekeeping mission to she's, her, she's, she's retired now. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's retired. She retired recently, so she's uh, she's making the most of uh, Good for her. yeah. Oh, she is absolutely for her, yeah. dead right. That's what she retired for. She Jesus, get up and get her, a bit yeah. of sun in the middle of March. Not too bad, right? Um, so Ryan was in contact, <laughs> and he wants us to give some flowers to Wexford here. He says, surely it's about time that people do hurling podcasts uh, throughout Ireland start giving <clears> Wexford some credit. Besides Limerick, the only unbeaten team in the league at the moment and pre-season competitions. That's with more first-team players out injured than any other county. Uh, again, I'm not uh, arguing against this at all. I certainly took a little bit of Wexford ire a few weeks ago for uh, being outed for an error. But anyway. We, I picked, we were, I we picked Seamus Casey right. last week as my... Was it last week or the week previous? As my... Uh, my standout player of the league so far. Yeah. As I a mean, Kenny man, I thought that was very big of me. What are you looking at, Skell? Now you're 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 trying to 
I thought you picked Jared Garage Connor. No, I said he was the obvious one, because, but I knew, like, let's say you were going to pick him or Will was going to pick him, but I was like, I thought Seamus Casey's been going really well. Yeah. So, um, the Wexford yeah. injury list, before we talk mm. about the win against Waterford today Leach in, Liam Ryan, Connor Davis, Jack O'Connor, Connor McDonald, Rory O'Connor, Limo McGovern, D. O'Keefe, Conal Flood, O'Sheen Foley. So that's two All Stars, other guys who've been nominated for them, key players who've played throughout the team. I, that is. To be fair, Skell, that's a lot of first-team players that are missing for Wexford. And to be fair to Roster, he's bringing in some of these younger players that he knows a bit about. He's mixing the blend up a little bit. And when these guys start to come back in, Wexford have got a nice bit of depth. And you'd have to be happy enough now at this point, one round before the end of the league. Here they are with a chance of reaching the semi-final. Guaranteed they're going to be in 1A for 2025. They've done pretty well, haven't they? they've, They've done really well. And I think, look, regardless of opposition today... If you're looking at a team set up right, you'd always say you want the your your forwards to be the first line of defence. And I'm looking at Lawler, you know, Byrne, uh, Casey, etc. And they were electricless. Like they were really electric. And the way they were able to retain the ball inside, you know, win the ball 50-50. And even if they lost the ball, you know, causing such hassle for Walter coming out of defence, that, that was the platform for their success. I think if you look at them, the, the Wexford team as a whole, yes, the most played well, but those three guys up top were, were flipping brilliant. They were awesome. You know what I mean? And it's... It's definitely, as a Wexford supporter, or even a Wexford player, it's great to see that the lads can come in who were relatively, relatively unknown, me, me, me included, relatively unknown, looking at the likes of Lawler and going, geez, you're, you're a fair unit. You know, even mm. Casey win the ball 50-50, even for the goal, even though by chance. But like uh, Keen Burnless, he's a fair operator. Yeah. You know, mm. and then the, the, I can't pronounce that, he's born as well, the guy that came in midfield. But he's got the, the kind of double bar name. Is he oh, Dunbar as well? Corey, Corey Byrne Corey Dunbar. Dunbar. Like again, looks very similar to Keen Keen Byrne, if you like, but in, again adds energy. But like they're they're three things. Number one, their fitness was excellent today. Two, their work ethic, and they were far better off the ball than Watford were today. So like when when Watford had the ball going forward to say Wexford were able to kind of stick with them, tackle them, turn them over key key times. When Wexford had the ball, Watford couldn't do that. They, just, they couldn't. So when when Wexford were breaking with numbers in the middle third going forward, they had bundles of energy and, and direct line running, which is very, very hard to stop. And just Watford didn't seem to have that. And I think if you're looking for looking for like a few guys to come into the team now in this in this league, whilst you're waiting the injury people to come back, you've got loads. Like you've got loads. Like there's, there's a lot of lads there that I would say, put my hand up and say, I didn't know who they were before they started playing the league, you know, three or four weeks ago. And right now they're going they're on the, the, the road to becoming household names. So yes, you you named off a, a good injury list there, Will, but I think what Roster has done Again, I'm not, I'm not in the setup. He's put, and, and I wonder is this because it's a Wexford man over Wexford? I, d- I don't know, but like, it seems like they've got a re- today was a real prideful performance, if you know what I mean. You know, loads of energy, like never say die attitude. And it just, it, it, and if you watch Raster on the sideline, he was very animated, but in a positive form. He was like, he was playing mm-hmm. with them. Do you know what I mean? There was nothing negative about him. There was nothing towards the referee, as far as I could see, nothing towards his opposite number. But it was like, he was kind of pushing the Wexford players as much, as much as they could. And like, if you look in at your, if you look out at your, your, your manager, you want to get energy off them, but you want to get positive energy. And it just, it seems like that's what's happening. And look, this could be a snowball effect. Let's, it's moving in the right direction because we were saying last week, Wexford need guys, new guys to come in and push this a bit further than what has been done over the last 10 years. And look, I thought it was a really good performance when you go five points down at one stage and six points down and there's a battle back to close the gap to three points prior to halftime, which was critical, you know, and then to see our performance, really impressive. And then full value for the victory. This does no look about this. Yeah, um, just on the point about Wexford as well, coming off the back of last week, because we were talking about, um, you know, this new kind of breed of player coming through. And obviously, this is a big win for them against Waterford today. But uh, Stephen KR 2TI, to give him his full title, uh, said, correct, that Wexford group won four provincial 21s, contested in two All-Ireland finals at under 21. Uh, 2019 still haunts us. Uh, the mood in the county is Davy had stuck with the same lads for too long, and people are prepared now to be fairly patient with Rossi. Still not beyond us to reach a Leinster mm-hmm. final if things go right this summer and then Barry Power had responded to that and said 100% uh, Davey had about 18 favourite players that he used and wasn't giving young lads a chance so like this is a different approach Murph some of it is the hand kind of forced because of the injuries and the lads who were coming back in but at the same time if you were looking for any team coming out of the league right now I would say the happiness barometer would be pretty high if you were a Wexford supporter yeah I think particularly today's performance is Something that I think the Wexford supporters were crying out for, particularly after last year. Uh, and like he roster situation, like 
the way he has so many injuries and so on, like he's been handed that situation and he's just had to try and go and make the best of it. There's there is positives there, not to say there's positives of having injured players, but there's positives in terms of his hand was forced in terms of really having to go and trust so a lot of younger players. But in managing that situation and in terms of getting the most out of those players, he now has a really good situation on his hands where like you look how this game panned out. Uh, Wexford were down by I think it was five points before they got their first score. I think it was five nothing before I think James Casey got a free and pops it over. Um, and how they responded, and really between that, I think it was with the 40th and 60th minute, how they just kicked on um, when they got their goal. Yeah. Okay, grand a bit fortuitous, but got the goal, and it's, it's like they smelled blood, and they started getting really good scores after that as well. They were really aggressive. They were driving forward, maybe spilling a few balls, but you know, redeeming themselves, getting the ball back, moving again. Very aggressive, and I agree with you, Scale. It was actually a point I thought about during the game. You know, where where roster on the line, you could see him like you know he was really balanced. He was you know obviously getting involved in the game, not losing the head. He was very calm and cool, but obviously. When the game was in the melting pot, he was kind of, you know, sh- reflecting onto the field, you know, his emotions of a bit of urgency, you know, see out this game. And they did see out the game as well, which is which is important, you know, because Watford had their chances there to come back at them, to kind of weather that bit of a storm and, you know, saw out the game, finish it out by three points. So I think that performance today, like that was a performance it makes for people who were kind of starved of last year. And just, you know, when you consider where they were, not even this time a year ago, but like fast forward a few weeks, it was last round and playing Kilkenny down in, in Wexford Park and trying to avoid relegation and all these things. Um, you know, th- I mean, they, they, like it, it, it's light years apart. And I was really looking at this Wexford team today going, you know, if they if they do go, get those players back from injury and everything is going well for them, you know they're not they're not very far off getting to a Leinster final. You know that's realistic. If they keep that momentum going and they don't know there's potential in the next while is that you know they falter a small bit and, and the confidence might get knocked and they're able to pick themselves back up it, it, I, I, it's not to say that they're going to have a clear run into a round robin and that this feel good factor stays going but they are at a nice place at the moment where they can be really positive about what they've done while still pointing to mistakes like the Offaly match where they just didn't start that game at all you know so I think Keith Roster will be very happy where they are going home tonight now he'll be saying right we've got our results that we needed without being perfect, so the lads can't get ahead of themselves, you know, I can still point to them. And I can also point to lads with players to come back. So if you think you're in this team now and that's it and you have your jersey, well, you know, say that to Liam McGovern, say that to Dio Keith, say, say that to Liam Ryan. Like, there's so many players there. So really, I think quietly, and even without being spoken about, I think Keith Roster will be happy enough where Wexford are. And I think every Wexford supporter will be happy at this stage now that, like, if, if you told them this at the start of the league, this is where you'll be, I think they'll go, yeah, 100% happy with that. He's 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 in a great spot now in the sense that like he's created like, yeah, indirect competition in his group. Yeah, yeah, so, like, and he's he's earned it as well. He's earned yeah. it, you know. If, if you've got a stagnant fifteen or, or sixteen players, and say the competition subsides goes goes down, but now he's got the young guys who are chomping at the bit, saying, you know, I can I can make the team here. So you were naming the list of people that are missing, Will, and I'm asking myself who is guaranteed to get back in, and you're saying fifty percent. At minimum, obviously, but there's lads there that have played over the last couple of weeks against Clare and against you know, Watford, tough fixtures, and say we're keeping the jersey. It's hard to see how the likes of King Burns to start. It's hard to see like Damien Reck is like was savage into back again. Like he's he's been one of the players of the league for me actually. Mm. After after looking at him today again, so I just think they're in, they're in a really good spot going forward, and R- Roster has them in a nice in a nice spot now, a nice spot with a, with a, with a, a competitive group. Okay. That's a lot of nice words about Wexford. Let's prepare for Waterford here because a lot of Waterford fans are annoyed. A lot of other supporters have been making reasonable points as well. Paul Barry, 1212 on Instagram. Why even Waterford needed a goal that they have no player inside the 40? Uh, Evie Young, 41. What's gone wrong for Davey and Waterford? And loads of tweets earlier on which were just saying, you know, we need to talk about the Waterford situation. So Waterford struck... 13 wides during the game, which obviously be a big disappointment. The Probably the only plus point of today was Jamie Barron coming back in, getting four points and really getting good. game time into him. But the reality is there was Waterford scrambling to try and get a result and the result ultimately they didn't get. And now they go down to Division 1B. How bad is it looking at the moment, Scal? Um, look, it's not looking good. It's, it's hard to find positive words for Waterford. You, you're looking at a couple of individual displays and saying that they were impressive, you know, for periods, Jimmy Barron was excellent with the ball in hand. Mikey Kelly was a good primary winner. <clears throat> kind of lines from long distance shooting, shooting. But then you're saying there's not an awful lot less. <clears throat> and, I, and I think, to be honest, and I'm not trying to discredit anyone's performance, but 
I think the hashtag building one allows there now to this stage. Did they need to put in a, a set out fielder and have to take him out because look so at the way the goal and go back into the goals then? <clears throat> no, no, okay. he doesn't. No, Sean Ryan keeps the goal, but like even for the goal that was conceded today, <clears throat> excuse me, Billy, Billy Nolan rushes out like and he gets sidestepped, you know. And I, I think that that's really what a goalie does when he's when there's someone coming towards the goal, not in the outfield. So there's a few things wrong. And I was looking, thank God for the high behind uh, camera behind the goals because it gives such a reflection of the way the opposition, uh, both teams set up. And like I have noted here that Wexford set up on the, on the water puck out was really good. And again, if you can, like I always say, when the ball's in play, when they have the ball, you have the ball, they're puck out and they're puck out. That's the four elements of the game. <laughs> That's the size of it. And if you can dominate two, if not three of them, you're, on, you're a long way on. And like Wexford were really good on their own puck out and the water puck out. So it's very hard to see how water get a platform in the game. And like I, I have a note here about Casey's second point in the second half. If you watch the high behind, like Waterford defense, they let people up. Like they let the likes of um who was it, the traveler, your man, what was his name? I forget his name, but the, the Wexford cornerback travels up into the opposite 50 yard line before he gets contact. That's far too far. And like I think game plans are nice, they're lovely, but ultimately, if you if you go back to North Cross game, right, you strip it back, you have a much better chance of competition than when you try invest in this this kind of tactical. Uh, this formation is what Waterford doing with the ball and out the ball. It's serving them no no justice whatsoever. They're actually getting getting caught out when they have the ball and they don't have the ball. So I think it's just Waterford you just need to strip it back. And will that happen? I'd say that's an emphatic no. I don't think it's going to happen because there's people that have too much pride for to strip it back. They're going to keep going the way they're going, and it's only to the detriment of the players. I know they've got less to come back as well, but they're not playing in unison. They're not playing cohesively. They're playing nearly individually because they don't know how to play to the system that's been provided in front of them. Do you know what I mean? So it's all very... It sounds bleak, but unfortunately, it's, it is bleak. Do you know what I mean? And it's the same to, situation. Not here, but when you say people are stubborn, you mean Davy Fitzgerald, right? I do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do, because publicly when he speaks, it's, it's, I always find, find this deflection. It's deflection of his own plans, deflection of the group he inherited. Uh, or what he says, he says it's because the group he inherited or deflection on, uh, of the performance that just happened towards the previous manager or whatever about them. But ultimately... Like what's been produced by Watford over the last 18, 18, 24 months is has been in, done by David Fitz and controlled by him. You know what I mean? And Watford aren't playing well at all. They're not playing really well. Like, and even when you were saying that, so you were saying that some uh, Twitter user asked about people trying to get a goal, etc. But like Jesse Hutchinson again, when they were trying to, at the last minutes out on the far fifty, like what is he doing out there? You know what I mean, sometimes when you're chasing the game, just get back to brass tacks, shove everyone inside in deep. And try to play the ball indirect when you've got players you can do it like Fitzgerald, Park, and Patrick and Dizzy, but they just didn't do that. And but it's the puck out for me, Les. They're causing themselves on un, un, undue hassle with the way they're set up on puck outs, uh, on their own as well, because they're just they're great, they're leaving too much space, you know, to the opposition to have their puck out, and then too much space to the opposition coming into Waterford's half on their own puck out. So there's a lot happening, and I just think if Waterford are going to move forward, they need to just say strip it back, go back to orthodox, and, and have at it because they have a great group of players. We know that we've seen this before, mm. but I just don't. I don't think they're being structured correctly, and I think they're being guided incorrectly. Okay, Murph, your take on where Waterford are at ahead of the last round? Yeah, look, um, I couldn't disagree with with Anthony Scahill saying there. Like, um, I was the few things that I thought Waterford were actually doing well in the first half were like stuff that if you're if you're playing fifteen on fifteen, playing orthodox. You, you'd have a great platform to go and win the game, but because it was very much individual uh, kind of pockets of of really good hurling from Caleb Lyons, from a great field in there from Shane Bennett, from Mike Kiley and different things. But because where they were taking the ball uh, in the in these areas, they were they were miles away from from scoring at these times. They were kind of isolated as well. It, it, like I thought Caleb Lyons was really good and I think he's been really good for the league but it's been really down to his endeavour it's down to him just you know bursting the gut trying to get onto a ball and different things but I do I, I do agree with Skehel there like they're being stifled by their own game at the moment like Desi Hutchinson came on um, I think it was her, when it was Mike, Mike Kiley was going off and he came on and he was in around the 14 or the 21 and he was looking dangerous and I was like brilliant here we are now Desi Hutchinson is in and he's going for a few scores and like that then, when they actually really needed, I suppose, when they're getting a bit of traction, it's like that system was being trying to be implemented. He started having having to drift, which I believe it's not a case that it was him. He was having to drift further and further from goal as opposed to staying in there. Like the goal they got, a mistake from Wexford. Dizzy Hutchinson picks it up in the 21, actually fumbles it the first time, has two Wexford defenders there, but he still has the talent to just go around the lads and bury it. But there was no support anywhere near him because... Watford had gone right back, you know, so he shouldn't be isolated even in that scenario. But 
I just thought it was it was strange that when he comes on, they start to get a bit of traction to an extent we're playing a little bit or- orthodox. But then when there was a possibility to go win the game, they completely drift away from it. They go back into this system of being really far from goal. And like there was a chance they could win the game. There still was a chance, but they just weren't putting the right foot forward to actually go and do it. And I, and I believe that was down to the structure. You know, like I said, few individual pockets of skill and individual skill and, and, and brilliance from car or from water players. But that individual skill wasn't matched with the system that actually could support them in terms of driving forward, in terms of getting scores. It would just look like that they were a little bit confused at times. And I think these are these are things we've been saying week on week that, you know, they have the players, there's lads there showing, but they're just stifled. They're a little bit confused. They don't know what they're doing at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and Murph, if you watch the first 10 minutes, right, when they went 5-0 up or 5-1, they actually started with an orthodox setup. They did, yeah. I felt that, you know. Like when Baron, when Baron, Baron got a point to put Waterford 6-1 up, that came from an orthodox setup with mm. a puck out that was won and then came through with a barren run through the middle. Yeah, That was perfect. I was saying just Waterford, they have fixed themselves right now. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One one position change with Wexford in, one position change where they brought out one of the forwards and created an extra man in the field, turned the whole Waterford set up again, turned it on. Mm. The next mm. thing they went back to the old way and here you know, <laughs> this 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 revised setup that Waterford produced was actually a, a major part of the downfall. But when mm. they were going orthodox, they were sound. They were six one up. Yeah. One change then one change then triggered an overreaction by Watford, and then it just it's just actually goes south and waits for Boston says back into it again. Yeah. So I wonder. All right. So I don't want to be seen to rag on David Fitzgerald. So purely I'm going to read some of the comments that we got in, and this is what we've received uh, ahead of the pod. So Rebel Zabu here on Twitter. Will Davy keep getting away with these tactics he set out with? Because even my dog knows they're not working. It's quite sad to see those lads having to play the way they are. In general, they are a good side. Uh, also, similarly, JP McGrath asked him the question, do Waterford fans now have to question the appointment of David Fitzgerald even more, as well as the people who actually appointed him? If they're still in par- if he's still in power, does he get the third year over Waterford <coughs> to justify his appointment? So I don't know what he'd have to achieve. I, I, I presume at this stage, lads, as much as David Fitzgerald has said this is a longer term project, if you take where they were and that they were in a league final not that long ago and it wasn't that long ago that we were all talking about Waterford being a team who could potentially push Limerick, they're now going to be a Division 1B team in 2025. You would think that no matter how much you're talking about a long-term project, if Waterford have a bad championship this year, he's under serious pressure, Murph, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he is. I mean, I'd, I'd compare to Darry Egan last year. I mean, Darry Egan didn't, didn't plan on having a, a poor year and... Um, I'm sure he had a longer term plan as well, a three or four year plan. But if the plan isn't working, you know, unfortunately, yeah, you have to step aside. And like I do think, like previously we said, and this this is not saying anything about you know lads I would have played with, but like we, we spoke about the likes of Eddie Brennan maybe being a, a good fit for Watford at the time in terms of like they have a, they have a group of players there at the moment that you know they're not, they're not going to be around forever and they have potential of. If, if not winning something, but actually create the platform for what might come true behind them and, and keeping that, you know, that good generational form going with Watford. But if if you, out of politeness, I suppose, keep doing what you're doing um, and and hope, I suppose, that, that someone after two, like, I mean, last year wasn't great. This year doesn't look like it's, it, it's going to be even as good as that. It looks like it's going to slip even further. Do you continue doing the same thing or do you go and, maybe have a look at a manager that might be a good fit. And that's the thing. It's not just a case you want to go out and pick up, you know, any any old manager that's out there in the scene. You want to pick a manager that's a good fit. And I think at the time, you know, if you look at where these Watford lads at their, are at the moment, they're looking like that they need a little bit of confidence, that they need someone to come in and bring, bring things back to basics. That'd be quite refreshing. I, I've been in situations as a player where you've, you've maybe been involved in a setup where it, it can be a little bit confusing, you know, where, where you don't really know what you're meant to be doing. Um, you can have all the team meetings you want and you can you can lay out all the plans, but when you get out in the field, you suddenly are a little bit confused. And that's what I feel that this Watford team have. They need to have a manager that really, I suppose, goes back to basics, instills it like, okay, we need to go orthodox here. Um, I'm going to trust that you have the talent to go man on man to go 15 and 15 and that we're, maybe we're not going to win every day but we're certainly going to get more results than we're getting at the moment so if the, judging by the way they're going at the moment it looks like that they'll go into a Munster Championship uh, and I hope this isn't the case because I think a championship with Watford is, is automatically a better championship but yeah. it looks like they'd potentially go out with a whimper here you know they're, um, well, they're rank outsiders right now if we were making the oh, completely, yeah. based on what yeah. we've seen there's very little chance that Watford are going to be in the top three like 
I think Scal said a few weeks ago that they just get the wooden spoon. Like I think that's where we're heading at the moment, and it's it's a pity. And I say that, you know, I'd say that with a heavy heart because I look at a lot of those Waterford players. You know, Jamie Barron, Desi Hutchinson, um, you know, Tyke the Burke and all these lads, and they're great players. You know, love watching them play. Caleb Lyons, you know, great players as well. Jack Fagan, and all these lads, they're brilliant players, and I don't want to see them. I suppose selling themselves short. I don't want to see themselves being being part of a team that they don't get to flourish it. As a player, all you want to do is flourish. You want to achieve your potential. And if your potential isn't good enough, well at least you know you can you can make a peace with that. But I don't think these players are achieving that at the moment. And and that's something that I suppose I feel for them in, in that scenario. And I think you know if 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 things keep going the way they're going, I think even Davy kind of has to admit, okay, well maybe I'm just not the right match. You know, you don't have to hang your head in shame. You just go, okay, maybe I'm not the right match here. And the county board say, well, look, this isn't working. But you know, I think if you're to do justice to players, find something that fits, get the show back on the road, and you still have a good few more years here where you have really talented players where you can, you know, look at Wexford there. You know, they're after getting things back on the road again in a very short period space of time. So I think to bring you back to the start of your question, well, you know, if, if it keeps going this way, you can't really go with a third year. But, you know, it'd, it'd be a well, bit if, mad. I think more if, if Kim McGrath and the 20s go well for Watford this year, you know, particularly in Munster, when they're, yeah. I suppose, when they're given that much of a chance because Limerick and Cork are relatively strong. But if they have a competitive championship and do well, do you know, is, is he going to step up you know, as a Watford mm. man? A very, very proud Watford man. We saw how he reacted, you know, uh, two years ago when, when they petered out the championship after clear. So, like... If, if things uh, pan out the way we, we think they're going to happen, you know, Hurland's, Hurland's a, a game that can change, the landscape can change very fast, but if Watford do potentially get the wooden spoon, I think there's internal pressure. I think the people of Watford won't stand for it. I don't, mm. I don't think they will. I don't think I don't think one-off performances here, here and there would actually save them. You know, I mean, the, the management team, I think there's going to be pressure from internal to go and go back to a Watford person. So yeah. it says a lot, a lot going forward there in the next three or four months. Yeah, I think if Davey was on the call with us right now, he would <clears throat> point to the fact that he was appointed as a serial winner to come back in here for a second term. But that comes with its own issues as well. I think he could disagree with anything that you guys have said there now. But I think he knew himself that he was appointed at a stage in that Waterford team's development where he was coming in to try and give those extra few percentages and to try and turn what they had into silverware. And if that doesn't happen, I think Davey Fitz would be the first to admit that that's been a, you know, that lack of success would probably cost him his job by the end of it. So... We'll see. Obviously, a lot of Waterford fans have been in contact, very, very annoyed with the way that they're hurling this year. And uh, we heard even, I think it was Shane last week was in contact with saying he was just dispirited about even watching the team at the moment. So they're going to be in 1B for next year. Offaly are also going to be in 1B. Uh, I was watching this game earlier on. Uh, Cork ran riot. Uh, Cork, if you put the ball onto their half-back line, they will run it back and they will do a lot of damage. It was the main learning, I think, for Offaly today. 5.28, Cork scored in the end. A hat-trick of goals for Alan Connolly. Darif given also uh, scored a goal when he came off the bench. And Brian Hayes scored a goal when he was introduced. Shane Kingston got the other one. Uh, Kingston and Dalton hit 11 points between them during the game. Uh, Declan Dalton hit the freeze reasonably well all day. It was a good day for Cork. And this was probably the game where we expected Offaly would get opened up on at some point. And it happened today in Tullamore. So they play against Clare next time. Uh, to preempt what Skell will be thinking, uh, Johnny Kelly, the Offaly manager, said after the game, he's basically going to release the under-20s off to hurl with their own group for the next while because they need to get ready now for the Leinster under-20 <laughs> championship. So it's going to be extended members of the panel that are going to be used next week against Clare. But that's where they're at. Uh, Cork have left themselves in a position now where they play against Wexford. And if Cork win against Wexford, they'll be assured of a top three finish uh, next week as well so it's uh, Wexford and Cork very much in pole position before we head towards the members pod uh, this, these are how the tables sit at the moment uh, so in division 1A Clare on top they've got seven points secured they should beat Offaly in the last game they're going to be going to the semi-finals uh, Kilkenny are just behind them uh, currently with Wexford with both teams on five each uh, Cork are on four Waterford sitting on two after their defeat and Offaly sitting on one. And in 1B, and we'll talk about Skell's already hinted he reckons the Galway aren't going to beat Limerick this coming weekend. Uh, but Limerick out in front at the moment, four wins and four, they sit on eight. Uh, Tipperary on scoring difference just ahead of Galway as things stand with those teams on six. Uh, Tipperary will have to overturn. It's a 30-point deficit in scoring difference at the moment, but they'll be looking to put Antrim to the sword. And then the teams who are in dead rubber positions, Dublin West Westmead, both on two points. It's their last game, doesn't matter because neither of them are going to qualify for 1A next year. And Antrim are preparing at the moment for the Leinster Championship next month. 
that's how things stand in 1A and 1B. And just before I go, a quick mention of what's happening in 2A. We know that Carlo are now into the final because they've got head-to-head -head against Leash. Four wins and four for them. Uh, they won this afternoon against Down, 320 to 218. Uh, Leash opened up somewhat away from home against Meath, putting that Carlo defeat behind them. Leash won 426 to 112. Willie Marr, their manager, was not in charge because he was away on business today, which is probably an unusual situation in the middle of the league. But Eamon Jackman and our old buddy Sean Flynn were in charge of Leash this afternoon. Uh, they are now up to six points so they're going to have a home semi-final and then after that you've got Kildare and Down on three points Kildare started the weekend at the bottom of the table sit third now as things stand uh, Kerry on two it's been a very disappointing campaign for them three defeats from four and Mead also sitting on three defeats from four so that's how things are in Division 2A remember that the top couple of teams in there will be going up to the new Division 1B for next season. Lads, it's been a pleasure for what's been a free pod so far. Nice bit of needle, a bit like the games this week as well. And we will uh, reassemble for the members pod. Thanks, lads. Ciao. OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Ford Gosh Energy. Proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling